Today's guest is Jeff Lee. Jeff has been a fixture in a New York City Chinatown environment for over 30 years, starting in a rock and roll band called The Heat. The Heat had a hard edge, hard rocking style indicative of the time. He performed across the United States and even opened up for such notables as the Ramones and performed on American Bandstand. In 1985, Jeff appeared in Dino De Laurentiis' Year of the Dragon. Later, he had a sizable role in Revenge of the Green Dragons and most recently, Made in Chinatown. So without further ado, Jeff Lee. I just wanted to make sure it's clear. It's, it's Jeff or Doc? I'm trying to get the pronunciation right. It's it's Jeff Jeffrey. It's the English, like uh, Jeffrey Chaucer. Right, right. Okay, okay. Holder. <laughs> so, uh, how are you holding up with this uh, COVID nineteen isolation? Uh, I gotta say, it's been trying um, mentally. Totally. Uh, mentally. Yeah, and just like not working as always, but I have been keeping busy. I have been doing tiny little videos. Yeah, no, I saw that you had just done something for uh, China Mac, right? Instagram handle China Mac, when you guys with me. The Jungle Episode 4, right? You played his dad. Right, right. Uh, I've, I've actually worked with China Mac like three or four times. Okay, okay. And how is that with this current situation, um, with the COVID-19 situation? Uh, I saw you were wearing a mask during the scene. Yeah, yeah, it's all current. Um, the, the, the little video you saw was in conjunction with the release of his uh, EP. Okay. So it's, he's, he's really got a handle on uh, social media. Okay. I mean, when he releases, when he releases a, a, a video, he gets like thousands and thousands of hits, views, thousands, yeah. That's the new medium right now, you know, that's, that's what you got to do. But you felt safe on set, you know, you're not concerned about the coronavirus or... Uh, 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 about four or five days after that, I went for uh, viral, viral testing. Okay. And I went for antibody testing, and I got the results yesterday or the day before, and I'm negative. Okay. okay. So I've been, I've been you know, careful. Sure, you have I to be. Yeah, I know. It's just, just such a crazy time. Um, what they keep saying, unprecedented times, that's for sure. But uh, so I wanted to go to, uh, to the beginning. Uh, Jeff. So you started off as a, a musician, right? You... Um, you studied uh, Afro-American music at uh, SUNY, at one of the yeah. SUNY? Yeah, well, I come from, like, the Woodstock era. Okay. That, that music from the 60s and 70s. I see. Okay. Uh, I missed Woodstock because I was working in my aunt's coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> my friends actually drove up to, to the coffee shop, said, Jeff, you want to go? They drove up in a Volkswagen bug. Okay. Wow. So we, you know, we were the we were the Asian hippies in Chinatown at the time. Okay. Very cool. Very, very cool. And um, you were uh, also teaching at that time. Were you teaching uh, you at the college? You were teaching uh, uh, music or um, I had a part time job at Project Reach uh, teaching music to uh, keep kids off the street. Oh wow, okay. So, yeah, I enjoyed that. And then uh, I uh, joined, while I was working there, somebody approached me to play bass in a band. Nice. That had, that had a gig lined up at CBGB's. Okay. And, uh, uh, so CBGB's was the hot, uh, the hot um, bar, um, rock club back at the, day, at the time, right? Yeah. yeah. And so the scene back then was the music was like what it was like uh, the Ramones or was it like um, that time gen generation like the Ramones or and uh, like the Runaway yeah. that kind of hard sound yeah like uh, they, new wave 
Okay. Punk, punk, like clash. Okay. You know, a little bit of glam, you know, um, uh, mixed in there. Mm -hmm. But the, that was, uh, this was right after, like, the New York Dolls. New York Dolls, right. The glam rock punk band. Right. Um, and that was a Busted Point Dexter's band or something? Busted Point, right? And he was called uh, Davy Johan, the like, like, trivia, right? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, yeah, we rehearsed in the music building on... On Eighth Avenue, about around Thirtieth Street, and I saw him in the, I saw him in the elevator. Very cool. <laughs> and then uh, I says to him, "Yo, David Johansson." <laughs> By the time he had changed his name to Buster Poindexter, so that was a <laughs> That's funny. And uh, so you're playing, you're playing guitar. You're singing, also. I noticed um, at that time. In the rock band I played in, I I, I actually studied guitar uh, in college, uh, uh, studying Afro American contemporary music, which was jazz. That's jazz. They call it jazz. Yeah. So I had uh, like a, a mentor jazz professor. You know, his name was Ken McIntyre. That's mm -hmm. so I went to the State University to go specifically to study with this guy because mm -hmm. he. Uh, my friend told me about it. I looked him up. I said. Okay, so my head was going, all right, I'm going to do the discipline of jazz, but I really did not follow through with it. Okay. You know? And in the meantime, this rock thing came up. Yeah. So I kind of rode the rock wave for a good five years. You know? wow. And then intermittently, every couple of years, it would come up again. Okay. You know, where the band would kind of revive itself. I see. Because okay. we went through the whole spinal tap experience with rock with rock bands and it, you basically played all over the country even overseas and, and whatnot mostly mostly the east coast we never we never really played the west coast uh, okay. up and down we go down as far as washington dc we go to pennsylvania very cool uh jersey uh the fast lane club we we would open for bands like uh joe jackson Mm -hmm. And we opened for the Ramones a couple of times. Oh wow! Okay, okay. And so uh, we were we were relatively hot. We put out a single. We put out our own independent single. We got air airplay. Right. We got played on American Bandstand. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, that was kind of. I don't know how we got on American Bandstand, but we did. We, you know, we were not that really that type of dance music. So we, our score was only like, you know, in the 80s. You, know, sure. you really needed 90 or 95 <laughs> to, get, uh, to get picked up. So, uh, but we were signed to Polygram. We actually were signed to sure. the main. Were, uh, were, you the, were you the first or the only Chinese-American um, rock musician at the time? I, I can't even think of. Oh, no, there were a couple. Like my inspiration for actually getting into rock music was a guy named Charlie Chin. Charlie Chin, yeah, from the West Coast. He was the lead singer of a band called Cat Mother and the All Night Blues Boys. Cat okay. Mother and the All Night Blues Boys, and his band. I went to go see Jimi Hendrix at Madison Square Garden. Okay, and. Uh, Cat Mother and All Night Blues Boys was was touring with with the Hendrix and they opened and so all of a sudden I see this this uh, uh, Chinese guy with a long long ponytail. That's so cool. He's in front of twenty thousand people. That's awesome. As the lead singer at Madison Square Garden, and I'm going, and I'm like eighteen or nineteen, and I'm going. Wow, this is possible. <laughs> that, but you know, nobody knows about that. That's not promoted at all. This is the first time I've ever heard of it. That, that there was a Chinese rock musician touring with uh, Jimi Hendrix. It's crazy, you know? Okay. Well, Charlie was great. He's a, he's a great singer. He's a songwriter. Uh, he played banjo. He played banjo on the Buffalo Springfield album. Okay. That's the late 70s? What, what year was that? That was the late 60s, 70s, early 70s? 
Yeah, early 70s, could be even late, late 60s. Mm -hmm. I think late 60s, really. Um, yeah, he, he's got he's got the banjo solo on Bluebird on, on right. Buffalo. So you can check it out. Just he was a roommate with Stephen Stills. Oh wow! Okay. And I actually met him later on, uh, and actually learned you know some guitar from him. Wow! Amazing. Amazing. Great guy. Amazing. So um, at this time, uh, did you feel that, uh, that the, the general consensus in the U.S. at that time were like more open towards seeing um, Asian Americans in like something that was more trendy as rock at, um, was, or did you see, feel that it was something still of a little bit of a black or they were not really promoting it or? It, it's almost as if I was not even that conscious of it. Okay. At the time, from where I was coming from, it's just that I knew I stood out only because there weren't hardly, there were one or two, yeah, there were a couple of them. Okay. Uh, we used to play Max's Kansas City a lot. Kansas City. We played, we played on Fridays and Saturday nights. And there were guys like Al Cap, who's Japanese American. Um, there's a, co a couple of others like this. I can't remember their names offhand. But we were really few and far between. Right, right. And I so listen to my girls. I was enjoying, I was enjoying the, the speciality of it. You know, uh -huh. I, was, I, was, I was new at the time, you know. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. It must have been a fun time, you know. Uh, I assume you were single then? You were before well, you were yeah. So getting the groupies and all that. <laughs> I'm sure that was. On the whole, this was in uh, the late seventies, early eighties. So you had the sex, drugs, and rock and roll scene. Yeah. What yeah. it was uh, everything you could imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm grateful that I survived. You grateful I survived? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Good experience, I guess. Yeah, I listened to one of your um, covers on YouTube. If anybody can listen to it, he, he does. A cover. You did a cover of a Neil Young song, right? Uh, the needle and the dam. Oh, oh, yeah, that was an acoustic guitar. Yeah, very, very nice. Very, very nice. You have a beautiful voice. It was really well done. Um, yeah, I listened to that uh, recently. I was like, wow, it's very talented. Um, the, the, band, the band at that time was it called the Heat that you were with? Is that is yeah. it? The band was called The Heat, and then we we broke up uh, because uh, the lead singer was, at the time, was uh, they had, there were conflicts between the lead singer and, and, the, and the guitar player. Uh -huh. You know, everybody was all like big egos. Yeah, big egos. Oh, oh, always, right? Ridiculous. Yeah. And, and so the lead singer got kicked out of the band. Lead singer kicked. Okay. We, we actually... But but uh, the the guitar player was actually a lead singer in a rock band before that, which was a very popular band, and he had a superb voice all by himself. That's why we were such a good band. We were able to pull off, even we would do, even though we were doing this kind of like really aggressive rock, we were able to pull off three and four part harmonies because every everybody in the band could carry it, you know, carry a tune. Yes. Yes, you can sing as well. Yes, yeah, awesome. Yes. That that's why um, we got over, you know, because we it's all, the instrumentation is only a bass drum and guitar. I see. Yeah, so, Very so, so you have to have the vocals uh, augmenting that and filling out the sound. Right, right. And, I, I feel like that was more music back then. Now it just seems so plastic and so very like programmed, you know, and uh, the music uh, from that generation just seems more like it comes from the heart. There's a lot more soul to it, you know. It, it has it's just so much more to the music, you know, I, I feel, my personal opinion. Yeah, I, I feel it's, it's definitely more uh, raw. It's more, it's kind of the difference between analog and digital. Mm -hmm. I said it has a more of a warmth and salt to it. Sure. That's good. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, my own POV. Right, right. 
Now, around that time, you started uh, doing, you started appearing in movies, TV shows, right? Uh, I think um, 1985, you were in uh, Year of the Dragon, uh, the um, Oliver Stone, uh, Dina De Laurentiis uh, movie starting to get Yeah, that was a great game. Uh, we, um, a friend of mine was connected with casting and somehow, you know, word gets out because there weren't that many musicians at the time. So uh, I had to pull together a band called the Shanghai Palace Band. And we all, you know, we, the, the, we're a giant restaurant that gets shot up by gang kids. Right, right. I get killed. You know, <laughs> the whole stuff, there's a whole uh, Caucasian stuntman who falls off a, Know, a balcony. That's crazy. That's crazy. Into a gazebo, into water. Oh my god! Oh my yeah. god! You have often in your career um, revisited that whole triad war. You played different characters at that that time and different shows. What what was going on during that time? Was there like a Chinatown bloodbath at that time? Um, in the what was it late seventies, early eighties? Well, seventies and eighties. By the time the 80s came around, uh, gangs were moving out of Manhattan Chinatown. Okay. They were moving more out to Queens. That's what uh, uh, Revenge of the Green Dragons is about. Okay. 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 Uh, and it, none of these, uh, yeah, I live on Mott Street, and, uh, you know, it was not uncommon to hear gunfire at night. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, and this was a turf war, or was war over war of uh, uh, drugs, or control of the drugs, or gambling? Or? It could be about girls. It could be about you know money, turf. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was, I'm even though I lived in Chinatown, I'm like a real ABC. Like I'm a joke sing. I'm an American born, and so I, you know, I interacted at times. But not directly. Okay. You know, I was, I was so, with regard to trying to tell, I'm here, but sometimes I'm not here. And that's a that and the times that I'm not there, that's when I'm doing things like practicing guitar. I'm doing sure, things sure. that are unrelated right. to Chinese Chinatown culture. I see. I see. I had the I had a distraction. That's good. So you, you think a lot of the, the problem at that time was the youth, they had no direction, so they were just falling into these gangs. Right, right. Like, um, early, way even before then, I'm talking about the 60s, maybe early, yeah, 60s, early 70s, I worked at the uh, Young Democrats Club, and we would get these uh, summer jobs some of the neighborhood youth corps jobs, and, and I would teach things like uh, leather craft. Okay. You know, like making belts. And, and uh, there was one incident where, so we're making belts, and we're working with this leather material. This kid makes a, a holster. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the interact. And we'd have that kind of interaction. Wow. <laughs> That was my interaction, uh, you know, when, when we do things like play ping pong, things like that, but okay. every once in a while you hear, you know, somebody's, somebody's in the East River, ends up in the East River dead. Okay. Yeah. And this is somebody that you may possibly know or know from somebody else that... Oh, no, I do. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, but my Chinese is pretty bad, so I, I wasn't that, I wasn't tight. Okay. Okay. And then so around the 80s or so, like that movie, uh, Revenge of the Green Dragon that you were in, it kind of moved out towards Queens and... and oh, yeah, and that was all Queens. It's all Queens, okay. I see, interesting. Um, so you were doing, uh, you were primarily a musician for a long time, and then was was the acting club ignited because of the role on Year of the Year Living Dangerously? I mean, on uh, Year, uh, Year of the Dragon, or was it... Um, Something that happened, something else that got you into it, or I think both both disciplines kind of fed off each other. Yes. Kind of, like for instance, I got in, I, I, what the movie that got me into the Screen Actors Guild was it, it, it is it was a German film 
independent film who came into New York and they were putting together a band. Huh. And somebody gave him my name. Okay. And so um, at the time I was playing in the band, I was playing in the band called The Heat. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't played much guitar, but I, you know, it's not like I stopped playing guitar, it's just that I was playing bass in public. Um, and so when I go to audition, at the time, I, you know, I had black, long hair. I was buff. Uh, I had a, you know, I was dressed like a rock star. Okay, okay. I had, I had, a, I had my, I walk in with my guitar, <laughs> uh, with the with the lead of the movie, who's doing also also doing the casting. He has to pick the musicians because he's a drummer. I see. The, the drummer. The movie is called Magic Sticks. It's about magic sticks. Okay, okay. This guy uses these sticks. People have to. Go crazy and dance. Sure, sure. <laughs> During that one, that was like a fluke audition where I had everything that the guy wanted, and I didn't even have to. I never even took my coat off for the audition. They just looked at you and said, "Yes." I never, I never even um, took the guitar out of the case. Oh, really? I didn't, I didn't have to audition. He just met me and kind of vibed off. <laughs> he knew. That he knew uh, because I could talk to him and say, "Well, look, this is this is what I've been doing. I've been working the clubs." He knew exactly where I was coming from, so he hired me on the spot. That's so after weeks, after weeks, that was my first SAG gig. They got me uh, my car. So that was, just, that was in the late eighty, nineteen eighty-seven or so, eighty-eight. Uh, I joined in eighty-four, okay. around there. In mid 80s. Mid 80s. Okay. Cool. So it that was, was after my band had actually broken up. But okay. I had another, after the, the, the Heat broke up, I was playing bass in that band. We for, I formed another band called Fierce Jones. Fierce Jones, okay. Fierce Jones. And we played CBGB's, Max's. We played CB's twice. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and then I was playing guitar. So I was no longer playing bass at CBGB's. I was playing guitar. Okay. So, that, so I feel like that was a fairly unique experience. Yeah, sounds awesome. And, and that was uh, what, that sound was similar to like the Ramones, maybe, or was it like a hard rock type? It was more pop. I will. I'll send you some. I'll send you some of the links of the stuff we had. It was not as. Uh, was not as. Uh, raw hard energy. It was more more pop oriented, more pop rock. More pop rock. Okay. okay. And, um, this year, I do want to put out another, you know, a music video nice. with one of fish, with a fish strong song. Okay. Okay. So you, uh, you, 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 I see it in the background. You're still playing. You're still jamming. I know on your Facebook you showed you're still uh, still doing your thing. You know, it's, it's never stopped for you. This is my 1950s premier amplifier. Wow, okay. 1950s. Uh, Very let me see. Yeah. Wow, wow. And that guitar behind me is my SG. Okay. okay. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. the first guitar I bought in a store. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. So, and well, this setup was so that I could do videos during this you know pandemic climate yeah, yeah. so this, right. this setup that you see here is is where i made a couple of videos <laughs> yeah by the window yes very nice all right they can see that on your uh, facebook page right if anybody's interested yeah, yeah i made actually like uh, three videos and somehow i made the three they were very very low production it was not like it was a Produced piece. This was more impulsive and just the Jones to do it and get something out. Right, right. Express something about the time. You know, oh, yeah, was, a lot of times when you do that, it becomes a lot more um, authentic and from the heart, so people can enjoy it. We'll we'll see that they'll enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah when I was <laughs> when the, the memorial one came up, I said, "Look, I'm no, not the memorial." It was, um, we were shouting at every at seven o'clock. New York shouts out to all the frontline heroes. Yes. And uh, so uh, 
Rob came through my head. I said, well, what am I going to play? So I did Amazing Grace, but Amazing Grace as a rock, raunchy rock version. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That, which is, you know, I could have played it pretty on acoustic guitar and right. stuff like that. That was not suitable to the situation where everybody's banging on pots and shouting and screaming. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. I just wanted to contribute. Awesome. awesome. And, also, and also, I'm always conscious, you know, that being who I am of representing in the proper way. Sure. 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 Hopefully, a uh, unique way. So as you were doing these roles, like in Magic Sticks or uh, Year of the Dragon, maybe even um, Curse of the Gr- Revenge of the Green Dragon, were you taking acting classes or did you formally study at some place? Or- oh, well, oh, you see, I had already, I had already been injected with the acting virus. Yeah. <laughs> From, from uh, spending time at Basement Workshop, and I was able to, uh, really lucky, I took uh, Marco's drama workshop, you know, for the time, for he taught, a, on the one day, this guy was the lead in Pacific Overtures, and the one day he was off, he taught a drama workshop at Basement Workshop, which was an arts collective Mm-hmm. Over on Lafayette Street, in Ken, you know Lafayette and Kenmare. Amazing, a huge loft. Basement workshop is is a, is a story unto itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was able to take his class, and you know I feel honored because he's like a master teacher. I feel sure. like uh, uh, if you're lucky enough to encounter somebody like that, and they kick your ass, and they do it. You know, you know what the real deal is. You kind of it, it kind of feeds you, it inspires you. Yeah. It's the same yeah. my jazz teacher, my you know, he didn't like the word jazz. <laughs> contemporary art, uh, contemporary American music, <laughs> Afro American. Right. So so that's that's what that is. Afro American is basically another term for jazz music. Is, is that what well you know? this, is, this is his terminology, just because he didn't like the term jazz in terms okay. In the real connotation, people don't know this. This was his 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 uh, uh, point of view. The the term jazz is was derogatory. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was kind of like it was kind of like slumming. It was yeah. slumming. It was like it had a bad connotation. Mm-hmm. In his that was his perspective. In his perspective. Just a very pure soul. <laughs> Yeah, Wakanda McIntyre. If you ever look him up, yeah, I definitely will. So, uh, when you trained with uh, Ma- 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 Mako, 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 yeah, Mako. Um, what year was that? Was that uh, in the eighties or? It had to be no more closer to mid seventies. Oh, mid seventies. Okay. Okay. So um, Marco was more of a, he was Broadway, he was a Broadway actor, he was a theater actor. You'd have to look that up whenever Pacific Overtures was running. Okay. okay. That, will, that, will date, that will date that time period. I see, I see. And then I know you've also studied with Saima, right? The legendary Saima. Oh, Paima. Paima, yeah. Yeah, Paima, well, Paima is a friend, of, uh, an old friend. We hung out and then... Uh, Taimar became Taimar. Taimar is in his own league. Yes, yes. He's a Hollywood actor, but after going through uh, Dance on the Railroad and, you know, hundreds of theater projects. Yes. Uh, yes. Hundreds of movie, yes. uh, movies. Yes. Um, he moved out. He, I had not been in touch with him, like, for decades at a time. But lately... Okay. He comes to New York and I get to hang out. Yeah, um, he's, he's definitely to be the uh, getting the attention that he's always deserved now. It, it, you know, as as a leading Asian actor, you know, and he's such a phenomenal actor that it's it's good to see that finally he is getting that attention. Yeah. 
I know um, I was lucky enough to meet you on uh, Made in Chinatown a couple of years ago, two years ago or so. And um, I know for me it was uh, it was I had seen you in uh, uh, Revenge of the Green Dragons and whatnot. So I was very uh, I was very fortunate to meet you, and I was very happy to meet you. Um, but uh, maybe you can walk through the process of that. That kind of came in late. I actually got a role. Um, I auditioned to play a villain, a martial art villain, but they gave me another role. Um, right. The father role. Yeah, they gave me the father role. But um, I know you, you were involved early on with that, and Mark Mark Wiley was the writer of From Me in China. The audition process was pretty, was, there was, there was a space of three or four months where we didn't hear anything. Okay. okay. Um, somebody on a Saturday, oh, my, I know who it was, uh, Danny, who's a stuntman, called me up and said, hey, Jeff, they're, they're having auditions for Green Dragons uh, right up the block from where I live. So okay. it was a no-brainer. So, you know, I got dressed. I put on my fancy coat. I walked in, and uh, I got interviewed by uh, Andrew Liu, the producer. Okay. Uh, and um, I, I got a, a three or four months afterward. We, it was just an interview. It wasn't like... This is Revenge of the Green Dragon, right? Not made in China. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah it, was like, it was kind of like an open call because I just walked in. Okay. okay. And um, uh, who else was... It was a famous casting director on that one. But I didn't audition for her. You, can have, you have to look that one up. I'm sorry. The name is just escaping me at the moment. She did The Life of Pi also. Okay. Uh, but uh, three, month, three or four months go by. This was cold. This was in the wintertime. And the springtime comes around. I get a call back. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that, was a, that was an interesting audition because uh, my scene, when in, for my scene, my family gets brutalized by a Chinese gang. Yes, uh, I remember that, yes. It's tough to work. Yeah. My daughter gets raped and my wife gets molested all over. It's, um, and so I had to uh, like go through a lot of emotions. That was in Brooklyn when we had the, those, those auditions. So I gave it all. Yeah. And uh, I was, one thing I did good about that audition that movie was based on a New Yorker article from, uh, this, I forget how far back. That, the movie is based on that, an article like say 10 years earlier. And the, the 26 page article in the New Yorker. So I, yeah, I found the article online. Oh, okay. And I downloaded it, you know, and I so kind of read the article so that I become more familiar since it was a callback, you know, more. The more history, the more data you have, it's better. the better. And so that while we were auditioning, we were going back and forth. They were, they were, they had questions about what happened in the story. They weren't really sure, and so I had the article in my back pocket. <laughs> okay. So out, I slapped it on the table. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was just like. To show them that this is a guy that does his homework. Okay. Yeah. That was, that yeah. Was where I was from, so. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very intense scene. You acted it. Uh, you acted in that scene beautifully. Um, it's it shows the emotion. I can't even imagine that kind of horrific thing happening to anybody. But the way you handled it, the way you portrayed it, was was beautiful. Um, but yeah, yeah this is, it's very well, that scene is actually much what you see on the screen. Uh, for that scene, for the Charlie Lowe scene, Charlie Lowe family getting uh, uh, utilized, yeah. they cut out about three quarters of it because oh, it was so Because you're so tough. Yeah. It was really raw and graphic. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, gave you, they gave you the uh, whatever, the, the, the R version instead of the X version. <laughs> Were you, uh, did you get to uh, work with, Ray Liotta was in that movie, correct? Uh, I believe yeah, I didn't. You haven't seen it. I didn't, I didn't. And 
I know you, uh, you, met, a, you met Shing there, Shing Ka. What, did you meet Shing there at that production? We did at the same time. At the, I think it was even the same day. The same day, okay. okay. And um, then from Revenge of the Green Dragon, how, did, how were you alerted about Made in Chinatown, the production that we were in? Um, um, Shing pulled me in. Shing pulled you in, okay. Yeah, Shing pulled me in. Um, and then he, he says, well, you could do these three parts. <laughs> and I, and I, was, I, I was flattered. I said, well, why do you... Why don't you just hire three actors? You know, I don't, not, <laughs> right. um, but after afterward, after I read the script, I said, "Well, this is so. This is like corny good. It's so corny, it's good. Right. And that's the type of movie. It is. It, it's it's a family movie. It's a family movie, sure. And um, I love doing comedy. Right. So if I feel if we can if we can. But, uh, you know, my comedy that I do is more of the straight man. Yes, yes. It's not telling jokes. It's, it's yes. playing it straight to, to make a, a, <laughs> a, a, a dramatic a scene funny. Now, I, I, I would in, uh, <laughs> did you audition in, you auditioned in Philadelphia at, at, at that bar restaurant. Correct for this movie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For all three roles? Did you have to audition for all three, or did they just give you one? I can't remember what Mark did because I, I was going in for the Mark Short I actually auditioned for only the uh, knowledge, which was the old you know, knowledge and wisdom. Okay. I so remember. And uh, they saw that we had a good chemistry. Yes. Uh, yes. Friends. Yes. Friends. So, Definitely. Yeah, that was um, that was a crazy. Idea. I met you there, and um, it was just interesting. It felt like a very much like an old school, uh, run run Shaw like um, classic kung fu audition. Everybody was there. All the investors were there. You know, uh, the cast director Caroline Sinclair was there. Mark was there. Um, I think James Liu was there also, or it was you know, maybe James Liu wasn't there, but um. It was just, it was interesting because they wanted me to do like a martial art routine. I had to do martial arts and I had to improvise the scene. And um, yeah, so that was, that was interesting. But um, I don't remember who actually auditioned for the role I got because I, I saw Fenton there and he auditioned to play the poor dad. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't see anybody. I don't know if they were auditioned. I didn't even realize that they had this part. But when Mark offered it to me, I was like, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's a good opportunity. But um, yeah, it was a it was a wonderful production. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we come out soon. I don't know uh, what's going on with that. I've I've seen um, the latest tweaked up uh, version and it's good. Okay, there's another version now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there's another version past. Uh, I'm not sure which was the last one you see. Did you see? Were you in Jersey? I, I I went to Jersey and I also went to the one in in the, um, the Hell's Kitchen Film Festival. Right, it's better now. It's better That's now. All. It's better now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Issues with the sound, issues with the uh, colorizing, and it's it's definitely much more professional. Eved out, even now, you know, it's it's, it's not. <laughs> it was kind of if you're looking for that type of stuff, it really stands out in those versions you saw. Okay. So now it's more polished. Yeah, so and then it's, it's just stuck in this distribution hell right now, right? Yeah. 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 We were supposed to play Philadelphia. We were supposed to go to Philadelphia when? January? Uh, yeah. Remember? And then yeah. it got canceled because of Corona. Yeah. Yeah. Corona stopped a lot of things, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, I know you're very active in... Uh, in the political climate in the city, right? Are you involved in certain active, active groups or um, Asian American groups? Or? Well, um, I'm, I support anything that has to do with uh, Chinatown because I live here. Okay. You know, <laughs> um, well, anything that has to do with uh, the, the racial, whatever's happening with the racial tide. Yes. In America. 
I actually wanted to talk to you about that. Do you feel that it's it's more because of this coronavirus? Do you feel that there is actually more attacks against Asians, or is it more that the media is paying attention? Or you feel that there's more? Okay. Definitely. Definitely. This is the first time I went out and bought a pepper spray for myself. Okay. I normally, <laughs> you know, I'm in my 60s, and then normally I don't have that type of uh, uh, look over, looking over my shoulder all the time, although I, I'm, more, I'm more trusting, but now I, I feel like I, I know, I should know better. I should have something on me just mm -hmm. in case, and, and just as a precaution. So you feel it's actually worse now than say like maybe the early '70s uh, when people when it wasn't politically correct and people were you know saying calling uh, racial slurs to Asians and, and um, I think it was I, I think it was always there. It was always there. I, I just think that now yeah the administration has kind of uh, made it okay they they, they these. Crazies who are, you know, racists and bullies. Yeah. Uh, they who are unaware of the real situation. He's given them license. He's he's made it okay, and that's you know, big people just uh, they want somebody to to blame, and he's he's deflecting his own de deficiencies in this matter. Okay. By doing this, by bl by blaming China, <laughs> you know, basically, what, if you look at New York, if you take New York as, as an example and just be knowledgeable, use your brain, not your emotions, this is a global pandemic. What happened in New York was everybody who was infected came home to New York as soon as the travel ban was declared. Yes. And at that point, the whole tri-state area got infected. That's correct. Yeah. But people, but people are deflected into calling it a China virus, and all of a sudden it came from China, when it didn't. Chinatown, Chinatown, is actually in terms of the frequency of infection, it's actually very good. It has a very good track record. You know, yeah, I, more, I think it's ridiculous because I mean I see even here in Long Island a lot of the Chinese restaurants closed. There are a lot of them. Um, shut down for that period of time. And it's funny because these, uh, the Chinese Americans here, they have probably not been to China in the last 30 years or so, and not even anywhere close to Wuhan. So there's this kind of uh, feeling that, you know, anything related to Chinese is causing the coronavirus is really unfounded and um, kind of troubling if you really think about it, you know, so. Yeah. But, and so have you seen in Chinatown, are a lot of the stores closed now, or they've gone out of business because of uh, the oh, shutdown? They, they were closing, well, uh, over a month before everybody else was. The Chinese, the Chinese restaurants, because of specifically the reference to the China, China virus. Yeah. People just avoid, and that's when uh, races started coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. Uh, that's that's up to people like us and everybody that don't that that are that have some knowledge that have uh, that want. To. So Jeff, what what roles would you like to play in the future? What are you looking? What would be your dream role, or what would you uh, feel would um, release your artistic uh, expression? Is there well, anything? What what challenges me is to, you know, try to go against stereotypes. Yes, always. So, um, uh, even though you know I've I've played uh, like the the, uh, the older Asian father like lots of times, uh, um, I would prefer to do roles that are. Representative in a kind of universal way, more so, okay. or unique. unique like, for instance, like I could just play myself and play a Chinese older, gray-haired Chinese rocker. If I could play that, I would be happy. Okay. 
and, and, and that would be a piece of cake, but things on that order that are a unique art in an art sense and in a message sense and in a representation sense to expand people's thoughts. Like, oh, I had no idea <laughs> there are people like this on this planet. Yeah. So I want to keep I mean, I, so I, I think I've, have I answered your question? <laughs> I think so. I think anybody. Yeah. Ideally, like when I played the, uh, the, the movie that got me into SAG, I was the only Asian guy in this band. Mm -hmm. So that, so for me, that was for the for the German uh, lead to cast me. That's forward thinking at that time. It may not be now, you know, but uh, that's, I want to be that guy. You know, besides being the father and showing connection and, you know, those roles are always meaty. Right. You know, they, you know the bread and butter, they can be. Um, uh, that's my, that's my, that's my take on what roles if I, if I had to seek them, they would be the weirdo roles. They would be the <laughs> They're always those kind of eccentric roads and the roles uh, give you a lot more um, artistic avenues to, uh, to show your stuff, right? I mean, uh, that's for yeah. sure. And with your music background, I think you could do that very well, much better than uh, other actors. Hopefully, uh, I, I think you'll be giving that shot. If somebody listens to this, it definitely gives you that uh, that opportunity. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think we're about at our time. I, I want to thank you so much, Jeff, um, for uh, doing this. Uh, and I have, to, I have to tell you, it's been an honor meeting you and working with you in the past. And I, I hope to work with you again. Um, we will. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, well, uh, I'll spread this out and hopefully uh, you'll get that role. I think, uh, I think you do. <laughs> Here's in peace okay. and safety and uh, eat well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try.